Um, the session has been called the untenable status quo U.S. options, uh, policy options for Palestine Israel. Uh, we're here at the Democratic Convention, um, and we've just been through a platform debate of sorts. Uh, and um, I, we thought it appropriate to continue the debate, continue the policy discussion um, in a panel of this sort. And so we invited uh, folks who we thought uh, each of them making who had the the the, uh, the the kind of background and and uh, and and personal experience and leadership to provide us with a a, a very healthy and thoughtful discussion. Uh, to my left is Deborah DeLee. Deborah is not only the uh, president of Americans for Peace Now, a policy organization that has been dealing with Israel-Palestine issues uh, in this country for many years, but before that was was a chair of the Democratic National Committee. Um, and so brings both hats. Her, she understands the politics and she understands the policy. Peter Beinart um, is currently at, uh, you know, I'm going to have to read a Peter Beinart bio because <laughs> the, the one thing I would say about him, if I were to say anything, it'll be short for God's sake. I'm, I'm, I'm fluffing you up here. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I'm very tired and I get silly when I get tired. So just <laughs> let, let it go. Uh, no, I, what I was going to say is that uh, th the one thing I would say if I were to introduce Peter is that he is, he is a must-read writer. Uh, I read everything Peter writes and find it usually, I go, oh, shucks, although I don't actually say shucks. But I said, because that was the article I was going to write, and it's better than the one I could write, but I, I, I read Peter all the time in the Atlantic. He, he's actually quite marvelous. Um, but he is, his real job, other than writing things I have to read, is Associate Professor of Journalism and Political Science at City University of New York, and a contributor to The Atlantic and National Journal, and also a columnist at Haaretz. And he, if you're on his list, he'll send you his Haaretz articles because they're blocked. Otherwise, you won't be able to get to read them. Sam Bahur um, is uh, a, a Palestinian-American businessman who I on the one hand, we'll never forgive for leaving Ohio. He was one of our key political uh, persons there. But on the other hand, he's a, a hero of mine because he, like several other um, young Palestinians, made the decision after Oslo to go back, um, to saying, in effect, if this is going to work, I have to be a part of making it work. I can't be criticizing it from the outside. And so he brought his business expertise uh, to uh, the West Bank um, and started uh, some successful businesses and also continued his political activism dealing in particular with an issue that's been of great concern and that is the question of Palestinian Americans trying to travel and being blocked because of the Israeli both visa restrictions and also the, the, the scrutiny, they call it scrutiny, but it's the, the outright harassment that exists at airports. I was told to open this just by giving a a bit of context. Uh, <coughs> there were a lot of folks who you know, sort of overcome by what happened with the Bernie Sanders campaign that saying uh, in a session I was in just uh, last night, this is the first time the issue of Palestine has been raised and we've made more progress this year than every <coughs> any other year. The reality is that um, this issue of Palestine has come up before. In 1988, the Jackson campaign brought uh, the issue of Palestine directly to the Democratic Convention. <clears throat> we not only have a debate within the platform drafting, but we had a floor debate. We brought it to the convention itself as a minority plank. Um, 1988, the plank was mutual recognition, territorial rights, and self-determination. Um, I was told the sky was going to fall. Uh, I was told that you will destroy the Democratic Party. I was told that you will never have a place in this party again. Drop it. We uh, resisted, and we offered a bit of a compromise. Uh, the compromise was, we said, if you will just put the word Palestinian in the platform, uh, w we could consider that a compromise. I was told the P word will not be in the platform. Uh, it would be too controversial to do that. And so we persisted, and we had the right to a minority plank, and so we, we, we had a debate and a floor demonstration. Um, the reason I want to begin there is because uh, 
we called it breaking the deadly silence. Um, there had already been an American debate on Palestine. That was the year of the Intifada. I mean, people were thinking about it and talking about it. And public opinion polls showed in 1988 that there already was movement on the discussion. There also was movement in the fact that the administration uh, at the time um, was, had made an opening. Ronald Reagan was, was, had made an opening to talk to the PLO. I mean, uh, they were having a discussion, George Schultz with uh, representatives of the, Palest uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization here in Washington. They'd authorized that discussion to begin. Uh, the, the problem is that what I've discovered is that people have a policy brain and they have a political brain. And they somehow take their policy brain out of their head and stick it somewhere, I'm not gonna say where, <laughs> and they put their political brain in and think they're really being smart. Well, we can't do this because you understand or whatever. And usually what's behind it is a lot of, little bit of anti-Semitism. Even when it comes from Jews, it's like, you know, we can't do this because they'll spend money against us. Or I actually heard this year, uh, you, we can't do this because Sheldon Adelson will spend money against us like Sheldon Adelson wasn't already going to spend money against him, <laughs> or that any of the money he was going to spend was going to influence five more voters than the five voters that already are influenced by Sheldon Adelson's money. Ask Newt Gingrich how important and successful Sheldon Adelson's money is in helping presidential campaigns. But, but they make these judgments. And we've done polling. You're going to get access to a poll that we just <coughs> completed that shows that Americans are no longer in that camp. 65% uh, of Americans say Palestinians and Israelis deserve equal rights. The, the discourse has changed. Democrats, by more than three to one, um, support Palestinian rights, statehood, support even the right to boycott as a legitimate tool uh, against Israeli settlements. Um, Democrats have far more progressive views on this than the Democratic Party does or that the leadership does but somehow the leadership doesn't quite get it. They play chicken little with themselves and try to play it with everybody else. Um, I just wanna make a bridge for a moment, take a, a bit of a back step to the last panel when the issue of political rights and civil rights and civil liberties was being discussed. Because when I first came to Washington 40 years ago, um, I came as head of the Palestine Human Rights Campaign. We tried to join the Coalition for a New Foreign and Military Policy, we were rejected. Uh, 58 organizations supported us, three opposed us, and we were told to withdraw our membership application because we would disrupt the coalition if we accepted to join uh, because those three groups said they'd leave and they didn't want to lose them. Uh, three years later, we tried again, and this time we were asked to take a pledge that we could join but we were asked if you did join to sign a pledge that we would not raise the Palestinian issue in the coalition. Um, they said, now if somebody else raises it, you can speak about it, but you can't raise it. I refused to do it. We did win the vote again, but we were asked to withdraw because again, the same three groups said that they would leave if we, if we joined and they didn't want to lose their support. I didn't get a meeting with anybody at the Democratic Party for uh, all the way through to 1988. Um, in 1988, the Jackson campaign catapulted us into a new role. We got great national attention. We registered voters. We, we helped Jackson win some states. We raised significant amounts of money. Um, we thought that the coast was clear, but it actually wasn't. Uh, we still had trouble. Um, if it weren't for the fact that Ron Brown, as chair of the DNC, said, I'm opening the door to Arab Americans, we would have been in the same position. But even then, Ron Brown faced threats. There were people who said to him, if you, if you bring them in, you lose our money and our support. He called their bluff. It wasn't true. Uh, and we were in. But as late as 1992, we tried to get in the Clinton campaign and were blocked. I, I finally had to do the, uh, some very difficult things to sort of knock that door down um, and get in. And we did. But it has been a difficult path because, precisely because of our support for Palestinian rights. This is a very different thing than Islamophobia, which is a kind of a, a phobia about the religion of Islam and what it stands for. The problem that Arab Americans faced has been a political problem. Uh, if I'd been a podiatrist, people would say, oh, help me with my bunion, and I'd be uh, you know, the great doctor of the, the Democrats. But because I'm a person who is involved on Palestine, when I 
come into the room, it's the issue comes with me. And, uh, and there's an effort to silence, silence discussion. Um, so there's two things at play here for us. It's, it's on the one hand, giving us the opportunity to be at the table talking, which is what Bernie did this year, give us the opportunity to be at the table and talk about the issue as an equal partner in a discussion. And the other is having the discussion and having the discussion reflect the reality of, of, the, of the, the situation that is in the, in the, in the Middle East. Uh, because when we don't have that discussion, America loses. Palestinians surely lose, but also Israel loses. Because we've created a dynamic right now that is in a downward spiral of, of Israel being um, uh, unable to control itself and its own worst instincts, and Palestinians being in a position of having no control um, and finding the taking young people taking control in the most absurd, bizarre, and 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 god awful ways, um, and there's no adult supervision. There's nobody to say, let's pull this apart, let's help create space. We hoped in our platform discussion this year to create that space to say that the occupation had to end, to say that settlements had to end, to say that you can oppose. Um, efforts to uh, delegitimize Israel, but boycott divestment sanctions, that's a way of, of legitimizing Palestinian rights, not delegitimizing Israel. And for God's sake, don't be stupid about Jerusalem, saying on the one hand it's a subject for negotiations and then follow it with, but it has to be united and eternal capital of Israel. I mean, it's either one or the other. You can't put two sentences next to each other that totally contradict each other. There was no willingness to, to do that. And so we ended up with the impasse. The platform is better than it's ever been before. The language about Palestinians is better. But it, it, it doesn't give me hope, because it, you can say you want clean water and clean air, but if you don't present me with the tools and accept the tools to get clean water and clean air, you're not going to get them. You can say you want Palestinians to have independence and dignity, but you can't even mention that there's an occupation that it ought to end and settlements that ought to end and I don't know how they get independence and dignity. So that's kind of where we are right now, a, a debate that has advanced, certainly a public that is more aware and a broader based support, not only among Arab Americans and among Jewish Americans, but among progressives and activists um, across the country. I think a movement that's deeper than it was during the, the Jackson years. The question is how to translate that movement to fundamental policy change. Um, and for that, I'm going to start with Deborah DeLee, who is, as I said, the person who sort of crosses both worlds. Um, she has been in politics and has been doing the policy work. And so, Deborah, uh, let's go back to the Obama administration first and, and look at a lot of hope when he was elected. That, and when he gave the first, sp actually the first three days when he, he, he appointed George Mitchell and spoke quite pointedly about dealing with the issue and then uh, did his first interview with an Arab satellite network and then went to Cairo a few months later. Uh, what happened and how do we assess what happened? I think um, not just with uh, Middle East peace, but I think looking at uh, any issues that Obama dealt with and talking about his successes or failures or what happened, I think it's really important to take a look at what he inherited um, from the Bush-Cheney uh, years. Um, I think the, the Bush-Cheney Middle East regional strategy of uh, maximizing your enemies and minimizing your friends um, had a significant impact on obviously a number of issues that Obama was given. Iraq, Afghanistan, the pressures on our strong ally um, Jordan because of the huge influx of refugees. What was that? No, he didn't say that. I'm saying that. <laughs> but it's pretty good. It's my yeah. analysis. Yeah. It's not his stated strategy, their stated strategy. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what was I talking about? A Jordan. Oh, a Jordan? Yes, thank you. And also, the Bush Cheney years saw the split between Gaza. Uh, and the West Bank, and, and I think that, we, I mean, obviously it's critical in many ways, but one of the most critical ways for uh, Obama, uh, the challenge that it increased for Obama um, in dealing with Middle East peace is it gave him, it gave Bibi, gave Prime Minister Netanyahu, one more escape hatch 
an excuse to not negotiate. So it wasn't uh, just that we have no partner, it was that there's no way to negotiate with a split entity and I will not support two states. So I, I think that um, those were the mistakes, or, or those that was the inheritance. Uh, I think even given that, there were a number of accomplishments. I think obviously Iran, uh, and I think that one of the takeaways, there are a number of takeaways uh, on Iran. I mean, looking at facts count, uh, members of Congress were turned around and others were turned around because the community that worked for that agreement uh, and um, the leadership of the administration um, really turned people around by, by producing the facts by getting validators, validators count from the intelligence community, from the um, uh, security community, uh, and also uh, the coalitions work. That here in the United States, for example, uh, some of the groups that are here, Foundation for Middle East Peace, one of our sponsors, Plowshares, not just all uh, one religious or ethnic organization, worked very hard together and I think it made a difference. But I think one of the most critical differences in, um, in dealing with the Iran issue was that it showed, and, and Donald Trump may want to look at this closely, it showed that the U.S. still, with perseverance and toughness, can provide leadership uh, in the international community and with allies to overcome strong opposition, both domestically for him and internationally, to get that passed. So I think that's important. Um, we didn't make progress. <laughs> uh, he did not make progress on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, there's no way to say that uh, he did. Um, again, I think it was a challenge with what he was given. Um, but I also feel that there were things that could have been done that weren't. I also feel that, um, and you know, this is, as Americans for Peace Now, this may uh, be surprising to people, but the fact is that I believe, and we believe, that as long as Bibi Netanyahu is the prime minister with this right-wing government, that not only will we not have a successful uh, peace negotiations, but that it will uh, be non-productive, uh, not successful, and that it will set back American diplomacy and leadership. Um, so I think there are a number of alternatives. I think there are a number of things that the Obama administration can do, but I think that your question was talking about where we're starting. Let's talk about going forward. Okay. Are there some things that the president can do in his waning months that would actually make a difference? And secondly, what is possible for uh, the next president to do? I think there are a number of things that he can do, and I think there's a particular window of opportunity. Um, if you look at the, the uh, overlap of politics um, and policy and what is reasonably, what we could reasonably hope for, I think the, the small window of opportunity is the time between um, election day and inauguration day. Um, and I think there are a number of things that Obama can do after that. One, I think it's important for him to articulate clear parameters of what a two-state solution should look like. I, I should say, I, I believe that a two-state solution is really the only path to resolve this conflict where one preserves, the, one preserves both the, the Jewish and democratic nature of Israel and provides freedom, dignity, and sovereignty to the Palestinians. So when I talk about what it is that Obama needs to do, I'm talking about it in pursuit of a two-state solution. So I believe, one, he needs to uh, clearly state, develop and state parameters that are based on the, the Clinton parameters. I think that he needs to take a strong position on settlements, uh, demand a settlement freeze immediately. I think that he needs to engage um, the potential allies uh, to work with him on this. The EU uh, revived the Middle East uh, quartet made up of Russia, Israel, the EU, UN. and the UN. Thank you, Sam. I knew I was missing one. Um, and uh, the Arab world, 
to revitalize the Arab Peace Initiative, to work with the uh, Arab world on that. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think most importantly during that period of time, which we have urged him to do, is to either initiate or to lead or to support a UN initiative at the Security Council. Uh, if it's based on two states, it is totally in keeping with U.S. policy. I think it's a critical move, and I think it is a gift that he could give to the next uh, president. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan opened up talks, unprecedented talks with the PLO, which was a gift that he gave to Bush one, which resulted in the Madrid Peace Conference. Bill Clinton did the Clinton parameters, sorry, did the Clinton parameters. Uh, laid out the Clinton parameters, which was a gift to Bush II and allowed Bush II to be able to talk about, to support two states and to uh, <coughs> establish or to put forth uh, the roadmap. Um, and I believe that the gift that Obama can give to the next president is a UN resolution that gives some effort uh, and some availability on allies and some opening to, um, to move forward. Sam. From a Palestinian perspective, what you see there um, on the ground, it, is there confidence in, in what Washington can or might do? Um, and if parameters were issued or if a UN resolution were passed, would it make a difference in those attitudes? Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the invitation as well in this crucial time in the debate. It, it seems like a, a tragic comedy that we're back at the DNC. Uh, Jim and the Arab American Institute actually are the group that got me involved in politics as I was a alternative delegate from Ohio's 17th Congressional District to the Jesse Jackson campaigns back in 1984 and 88. And back then, 30 years ago, the issue of Palestinian statehood was front and center. Anyone who was involved in the issue understood that if, is, if the United <coughs> States was <coughs> honest about actually wanting to materialize a two-state solution that it had to recognize the other state in the equation. So eight Democratic National Conventions later, uh, the Democratic platform, as we just heard, uh, is walking uh, backwards, uh, as the Republican, I believe, uh, platform does. And both parties are, are refusing to walk the walk and continue just to talk the talk of two states. To your question, I mean, President Obama started off strong. He came into the White House with a pre-understanding, a deep understanding, I believe, of the colossal injustice that was done to the Palestinians. He took that knowledge, and on the first day of office, he actually called four Arab leaders, the Palestinian president being one of them. He then appointed George Mitchell, Senator George Mitchell, as a special envoy for Middle East peace. Uh, that lasted a couple years before Senator Mitchell walked away because he could not get the settlements to stop for one day. Then President Clinton made a very, very calculated move, and this was being done as Obamacare was being worked through, so it was a very sensitive time. And he told the Israeli <coughs> right-wing government that illegal settlement building must stop if peaceful negotiations are going to have any chance of being successful. Here is where the needle went south, because President, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu would have nothing of it. He basically, backed by the pro-Israeli APAC lobby in the United States, uh, took President Obama on. And President Obama fought back. He actually sent Vice President Biden to Israel to explain to the Israelis, to try to convince the Israelis that they were about to hit a cement wall, pun intended. They welcomed his visit by announcing 1,600 new settlement housing units while President, Vice President Biden was in the country. Uh, talk about adding insult to injury. I mean, the rest is history. Uh, and we Palestinians and Israelis on the ground are paying the price in human life and massive destruction for the inability for the US to not only hold Israel accountable, but to follow through on its policy talk with policy actions. W what the US president 
is stepping into the new U.S. president, the upcoming U.S. president, depends on what the current president, President Obama, does in office. There are two tasks that need to be done, and it is very, very straightforward, I believe. The first, after 70 years of recognizing Israel, 11 minutes after it was announced in 1948, it is time to recognize the state of Palestine. This, <laughs> thank you. This, 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 is, this is not groundbreaking. I mean, already President George W. Bush called it Palestine during his term. Uh, 130, over 130 countries have recognized Palestine directly, and 138 countries said yes to Palestine in 2012 when there was a General Assembly vote to upgrade the PLO status to a, a non-member observer state. Nine countries said no. Israel, the United States, Canada, Panama, the Czech Republic, the superpower of the Marshall Islands, mm. the superpower of Micronesia, and the superpowers of Nauru and Peru. That's where the U.S. put itself. If the U.S. is serious about a two-state solution, then recognizing the other state this late in the game is a no-brainer. The other action item that needs to be done, I believe, is to hold Israel accountable for its actions, like it already does for Palestinians. Israel is funded by the U.S., armed by the U.S., diplomatically covered by the U.S. like no other country in the world. It's a nuclear power whose security is guaranteed. With that reality in place, tell me again why the U.S. can't link its policies to illegal settlement building, house demolitions, movement and access restrictions, and the umpteen other human rights violations that take place every day in Palestine? This is not rocket science. We merely ask that the U.S. policy be informed by U.S. State Department annual human rights reports, which have logged these day in and day out. President Obama has the ability to recognize Palestine and set the record straight that the U.S. <coughs> is serious about two states. This would not only be the right thing to do after 50 years almost 50 years of a military occupation, but it would relieve Hillary Clinton from having to take on the pro-Israeli lobby for such an elementary step, which is so crucial to saving the two-state paradigm. There are constructive ways to engage this issue as we await for this long-standing military occupation to end, like all occupation, occupations before it. In this dark moment, supporting civil society is key to giving Palestinians hope. And as we watch the US party platforms moving backwards, the need for hope should not be underestimated. Our US diplomats on the ground, and we speak to them regularly, are fully aware of what needs to be done. Things such as lifting the inhumane siege on Gaza. I don't need to remind Hillary Clinton about Gaza. She personally negotiated the Israelis on an agreement of movement and access back in 2005. I see she uses it on one of her campaign commercial ads, but she forgets to add that Israel ignored every single word of that agreement, causing her to go back a few years later to get, find a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. Things that can be done are like allowing the Palestinians to build an economy that's worthy of a state. This is what I'm deeply involved in. We, are, we created an, or, an organization called Americans for a Vibrant Palestinian Economy to build relationships between American businesses and Palestinian businesses. Business will not solve the political issue, but it will get Palestinians in employment, which means they stay in Palestine, which is key to the political equation that we're fighting. And simply allowing those US citizens wanting to reach the occupied territory and being allowed to do so is something the U.S. can do more about. Organizations like the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, based in Kent, Ohio, which is building cancer centers in, in the West Bank, in Bethlehem specifically, and in Gaza. They shouldn't have to worry about their volunteers or volunteer physicians that are going to do surgeries in Palestine, if they're gonna be allowed in the country or not. 
Lastly, we are hearing rumors about different steps the Obama administration may take before leaving office. One is that the U.S. is going to state its parameters to a resolution, and Deborah touched on this as well. <coughs> After the historic monopolization of the Oslo Peace Accords, which failed multiple times, does anyone actually think that such a statement of parameters is going to resonate on the ground? Parameters already exist. They are codified in literally dozens of UN resolutions. The second is another rumor that the US will abstain from a UN Security Council resolution calling for a stop to illegal settlement building. That's like Starbucks announcing that they sell coffee. The only real moves short of ending the occupation is for the US to recognize Palestine and start to hold Israel accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is driving drunk on power and they're about to fall off a cliff. And the cliff has a name to it. It's called two states. We Palestinians can live in any political arrangement negotiated or even imposed upon us. Can Israel? One thing for sure, and I'll end with this, is that in any political agreement, we Palestinians will only accept to live as free people with full equality. It's a theme that we adopted from the United States of America. Thank you. Peter, uh, I sat there in the drafting meetings with folks on the different sides. There were the Clinton people, there were the Sanders people, and there were the independents who had been appointed by the party. I knew most of them. They were really thoughtful people. Some of them were, in fact, very smart policy people who've been implementing at leadership levels our nation's policy. Um, I couldn't understand. They couldn't accept the word occupation. I thought it was, it would, it would distort. What was the word they used? It would, um, it would, it would prejudge. It, it, that's the language they used. It would prejudge issues that have to be negotiated. Occupation has to be negotiated. Settlements, the same thing. What happens um, in our politics that, that how, do, how do people make those judgments is what, I, what I'm trying to get at, that end up um, throwing smart policy discussions away for what they think is going to be smart politics, uh, what I began with. How does that happen? What does it mean? Um, I think you have to distinguish the dynamics for for American Jews and the dynamics for non-Jews, because I think they're different um, in my experience. I know the first more intimately than the second, but um, um, I think they're, they're, when you're talking about American Jews, um, I think there are a couple of things. Um, is that even many American Jews who are inclined to be in kind of abstract terms progressive on this issue, they, they recognize intellectually that it's not in Israel's self-interest to permanently control millions of people who lack basic rights and don't want to live under its military control. Um, and they have a general predisposition, as most American Jews do, to liberal policies. But most of them still haven't actually been there on the ground. They haven't actually seen the things that Sam sees every day. And, and there's, it's, it's like talking about you know, criminal justice or, Amer you know, or the interactions between the police uh, and African-American communities. It's one thing in a kind of abstract way to know that there are problems and that, you know, people may suffer. Um, it's another thing to see it. And, and um, the problem is that inside the American Jewish community, we have created this mat huge infrastructure for be bringing people to Israel without really seeing Israel. Right? Um, uh, it's kind of a massive industry of disnified Israel trips to, for young American Jews, but also for members of Congress, right? And, and who come back and then speak with a supposed air of authority. And they may have genuinely learned something about Jewish Israel. And I, look, because I'm not against American Jews going to Israel. I slept my own two kids there for two weeks just, just uh, recently. Um, um, but um, it's the equivalent of going to the Upper East Side of New York right, never going to the Bronx or Harlem or Brooklyn, and then coming back and speaking about relations between the police and the African American community, right, and that's the machine that the American Jewish community has built for itself that it has exported to 
uh, politicians and not just politicians. And I think that when I meet people, I can usually tell when I meet American Jews by, with a few demographic calculations where they will be politically. It's usually age, religiosity, and money, basically. By those three factors, I can pretty much tell how far to the left or right people would be. Whenever someone surprises me and they are to the left of where I think they will be, it is usually because they have had an experience on the ground. It's because they actually have met a Palestinian who, surprisingly, turned out not to be someone who wakes up every morning hoping to kill as many Jews as possible, um, and, some, and someone who talked to them um, in, a, in a serious way, in an open, honest way, about what it means to live without basic rights, about what it leaves, means to be basically powerless over the state that controls your lives. And when American Jews hear that, often it touches them. It, it does touch us because it stirs something inside of us because we may not have had that experience ourselves, but our parents or grandparents had that experience ourselves. That sense of having to come to terms with powerlessness over, over the powers that can wreck your life and having to joke about it, you know, having to kind of laugh about it, having to find the strength to, to, to live with it and to maintain your identity in the face of it, that's a very, very Jewish thing. And if we could, if it was one thing I would do, I would do inside the Jewish community, if we could shame Birthright and APAC uh, and other American Jewish organizations into the, uh, about the absurdity of taking people to Israel and never having any interaction with the 50% of the people who live in Israel who are Palestinian, um, then I think within literally a half a day of those encounters, you could destabilize kind of false narratives that have been built up over decades and decades. I've seen it happen <coughs> again and again. Um, so I think that's a very crucial thing for American Jews. The other crucial thing for American Jews is the fear that they, that we will be excommunicated from our communities. You know, my friend uh, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum likes to say that you can go into almost any synagogue in America, at least any non-Orthodox synagogue, and come up to the rabbi and say, you know, I don't believe in God. And the rabbi will find, say, fine, please take your seat, please pay your membership dues. No, no big deal, um, uh, right? Um, uh, they might even say, I don't believe in God, too. Um, um, what, you, what, you, what you can't do is say uh, that I um, think that what Israel is doing is immoral, or I have questions about Zionism, or I think that, it, you know, you, that's, that's actually, in some ways, that's what's been made uh, uh, kadosh. That's what's been made holy and sacrosanct, right? Um, which itself is a certain kind of idolatry. Um, and so I think that then the challenge for American Jews, and this is a challenge I feel in my own life very strongly, the challenge is to root ourselves and our children so deeply in our own Jewish identity that we cannot be excommunicated. Um, that when I think about, when I teach the, the weekly Torah portion to my children, I do it for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons I do it is that if someone comes along and tells them that they're not really Jewish or that they're a self-hating Jew because they're critical of Israel, as people tell me very frequently, they can say to that person, okay, I'm a self-hating Jew, you're saying I don't have any Jewish identity. Do you know what the weekly Parsha is? Do, do you know what book of the Torah we're in? Do you understand, uh, do you understand basic elements of Jewish, of Jewish history and Jewish law? So don't tell me that I don't know what it means to be Jewish. I know a heck of a lot more about what it means to be Jewish than you, thank you very much. And I think it's that self-confidence that American Jews need in order to be able to criticize Israel and to be able to suffer the rejection that they are likely to feel from people in their own community who say you are therefore not really Jewish. Um, when, um, Um, when, I think for non-Jews, um, my sense is that there is a tremendous fear of being called, uh, called anti-Semitic um, uh, by people who I think genuinely, to their credit, um, know what that term means. They have a genuine horror of that term, as they should, given the history of anti-Semitism uh, in the West 
and, and also because, and I think it's important to say, because we are living in a world of, to some degree of resurgent anti-Semitism. Um, uh, um, we can talk about the reasons for that, but there are been numerous attacks now on Jewish schools, and Jewish synagogues, uh, in France and other places in Europe, uh, and polling about attitudes towards Jews in the Arab world is very frightening. Now again, we can talk about the reasons for, the, for these anti-Semitic attitudes, and they may indeed have a lot to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but when the forward newspaper goes and interviews Abu Marzouk in Hamas, and he says that he thinks The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a great book, um, that, that's frightening to people, it's frightening to me, and I think um, um, non-Jews uh, are afraid of being called anti-Semitic. Um, and, and I think that the way to respond, I was really, when I, when I, I remember when my book came out in 2012, one of the things that astonished me was how anxious the people who were interviewing, interviewing me about my book were. I was like, what are you worried about? I'm the one who wrote the book. I'm the one saying the controversial things. But I had interviewers who were worried that even their questions might be perceived as anti-Semitic. And for those of us who, who are inside the Jewish community know this issue, we know it's a minefield, but we know the minefield. I felt like they felt like they were walking through a minefield that they didn't even, they didn't even know the terrain of the minefield. So it was very frightening. So I think we need to have a, some kind of pact, it seems to me, between Jews, Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, and, and, and Americans more generally. And the pact, I think, should go something like this. When there is genuine anti-Semitism, which genuinely does exist. It's desperately important that non-Jews, especially Palestinians, um, call it out. Uh, it's extremely important to those of us on the Jewish left that that happen. Um, that, that, that if it happens in private, in private conversations, or if it happens publicly, it's extremely important that that, that happen. And I think that's part of the pact. Um, um, the other half of the pact, is for those of us who are Jewish and have at least some degree of protection for the, for the, from, from the claim of being anti-Semitic. Although I will notice, note that the Sam and Wiesenthal Center in its list of the most anti-Semitic organizations in the United States did say that several of the mo most anti-Semitic organizations were Jewish organizations. I mean, I, I kind of joked with my wife that, you know, we Jews are so successful that we can take over virtually any industry, right? Even anti-Semitism, we seem to have managed to make great strides um, in this field where we would think we would not do well. But anyway, um, I, I think that it then becomes extremely important for American Jews to be willing to put ourselves on the line to defend people who are called anti-Semitic when they're not. Because, as, as, because we know that American Jewish organizations and others will use charges of anti-Semitism to try to shut down criticism that they cannot really answer on the merits. It's not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. It's not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel harshly. Uh, if it were, many of Israel's own top security officials. If it were anti-Semitic to compare Israel to an apartheid state, which by the way, inside the Green Line, I don't think it is, but if it were anti-Semitic to compare Israel to an apartheid state, then Ehud Olmert and Ehud Barak would be anti-Semites because they have both raised that prospect. It's not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel incorrectly because people have the right to be wrong. Right? It's not incorrect to criticize Israel disproportionately. Right? All of us have the right to have our particular hobby horses. What does it mean to tell a Palestinian that they can't be disproportionately concerned with what happens to Palestinians? They have to spend equal time on what happens to Zimbabwe? I mean, the disproportion argument makes no sense to me. Some people are concerned about the whales. Some people are concerned about what happens in Burma. We have the right to be concerned about what we're concerned about. Um, it's not, and it's not even anti-Semitic to question Zionism. The Satma Rebbe, Christian Zionism. I, I happen to be a certain kind of political and cultural Zionist myself, but it's not anti-Semitic to have that conversation. Where I think it strays into anti-Semitism is when you deny the rights of Jews to live in dignity and security in Israel, and when you deny, and this may be more controversial, when you deny that we as Jews are a people, we're not simply deracinated individuals, we're not simply a religion, we are a people, and we desire self-determination, uh, uh, as do Palestinians. And I think to reject that, I do think gets you closer to anti-Semitism. But I think that um, the anti-Semitism is used so promiscuously, you know, I mean, I remember, uh, I remember it, it's used so promiscuously that I think it's genuinely an embarrassment um, and, uh, uh, and a desecration of the real history of anti-Semitism that has taken place and indeed of the real anti-Semitism that still exists in the world. And we have a responsibility to put ourselves out there to try to create a space for people of goodwill to speak their minds about Israel because they have the right to speak their minds about Israel just as they have the right to speak their minds about any other issue. Thank you, Peter.
Let me, um, let me go back to you, Deborah, and help unpack some of what we've just heard, because I'm, I'm still looking for the policy discussion of what is possible and where we can go. Um, there is a sense when you say, what, what should the policy be? We can all list what the policy ought to be, you know? Uh, the president ought to do this, ought to do this, ought to do that. The question is, what is possible? And therefore, what are the, what is on, first, what is possible? And then what would civil society do to move the, the, the goalpost closer of what is possible? Uh, what, j just do those two things, if you would. What do you think is possible now and in the near future? And what could we be doing to make what is possible easier and closer? Well, I think all of the things that we've talked about that the Obama administration can do between now and the time that they leave is possible. I think it is possible, and I think what we have, uh, not only are, are we able to do or should be doing, I think we all have an obligation to do it. And I would go back to some of the lessons, as I mentioned before, that we learned in Iran, uh, on the Iran um, uh, deal. I think it's extremely important for all of us who care about uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace, one, to work together, two, to use, there are enormous allies and validators who are non-traditional and who are effective in this. The Israeli security community, intelligence, uh, the Mossad, uh, former generals of the IDF, uh, current uh, officers in the IDF are all speaking out in different ways uh, on, on things that they feel are violations of uh, the human rights of Palestinians, on how the occupation, and they use the word occupation, their prime minister may no longer use it, he used to, um, but how uh, the occupation is damaging uh, Israel and Israelis uh, as well as Palestinians. There are validators to use. We have to work together in coalitions and we have to know our facts. I have to tell you, I am shocked every day when I talk to American Jews, when I talk to Palestinians, when I talk to others, people who are educated, people who read, who watch the news, if you can find news anywhere as opposed to entertainment, um, uh, but who don't know what is happening. And it's sort of what Peter's talking about, about being grounded in Judaism. We also have to be grounded in facts. People have to be armed with knowledge, with truth. You have to be able to argue. You have to be able to explain what's going on there. We are a very substantive organization. We have a publication called They Say, We Say. We put out the arguments that people raise with us all the time, and we answer them. We try and arm people. We just did a publication, Do This, Not That, and we talk about what people should be doing and what they should not be doing, and we lay out uh, the reasons for it. People have got to be armed with information. Let me just stop you for a minute, yes. because the question for me right now is, uh, it can be done. I will bet you it won't be done. Mm. And I'll bet you that some of the reasons it won't be done are... Tell me what you mean by it. That the kind of proposals you and Sam, for example, suggested that this administration could do and maybe the early part of the next administration could do. One of the arguments will be we don't want to put Hillary on the defensive. Uh, we don't want to create a situation that will be problematic for her when she enters the White House. We don't want to ruffle blah, blah, blah. I mean, I saw Bill Clinton who uh, had just come from negotiations uh, go into the Democratic Convention in, in 2000 and lie about best deal ever and Arafat turned it down. Um, and there were electoral concerns. I mean, this notion that electorally this works, Al Gore didn't win or lose because of Camp David. It had nothing to do with it at all. And yet there's this mindset that we can't do this because what do we do? What can we do to break through that and say, you can do it, not only can you do it, but you've got to do it. You've got six, seven months left, and if you don't do it, your legacy on this issue is done. I think there's a couple things. Uh, I think number one is timing. Um, I, because there, the, the issues will be raised and the reality will be raised that it will affect 
it, that if Barack Obama does it, it will affect Democrats running up and down the ticket, and particularly with the Jewish vote, and particularly with Jewish money. But there's Which, an Arab American vote too, and a Muslim vote. But the reason, but but when I said timing, I said the critical window of opportunity yeah. is from election day. Yeah until the right. next president okay. takes office. So you can set aside the, the problems, that, the political constraints that might come up in an election, and then you do what needs to be done. So you have to be preparing for it now, you have to be ready to do it now. The other thing that can be done, and that we in the Jewish community uh, have to uh, work <coughs> extremely hard to make happen, is, and I think we've done it enormously. I think we've done it, I think J Street has, has helped make enormous strides. We have to get politicians up and down the line on the ticket, uh, certainly in presidential politics, to understand that there is not unanimity in the Jewish community, that the Jewish community does not all speak with one voice, that APAC does not speak on behalf of all Jews, that the definition of being pro-Israel is not what politicians believe pro-Israel uh, has been, which is Israel right or right. That there are Jews who, are, who will come out and say that what Israel is doing wrong and that the definition of being pro-Israel means that you care deeply about a future for Israelis that they deserve as well as Palestinians that they deserve and that um, and that, that future uh, involves two states and the kinds of things that, uh, well, we believe it's the kinds of things that we support in two states. And I believe that that is changing every day, and I think that we have to continue. We have to be everywhere. We have to talk to everyone. We have to be visible. Uh, we have to change for elected officials and for party officials the definition of what it means to be pro-Israel and the understanding of what the Jewish community is and what the Jewish community feels. Let me, let yeah. me say one other thing. I think an enormous turning point for American Jews was, uh, or re this may be redundant, but liberal democratic Jews um, who might still, liberal on every other issue, but, but still uh, could be very conservative right wing or whatever on Israel. I think a very significant turning point was when Netanyahu uh, came to Congress and spoke against the Iran deal. I think that crossed the line for many American Jews who felt this is not right, this is not what I want uh, happening in our country, and this is not the way I want the Prime Minister of Israel behaving. And I think that that, that uh, shifted uh, and gave a comfort level to many uh, American Jews uh, to be critical of that and critical of the Prime Minister of Israel, which, which they had never done before. But for not them. to allow me to be critical of him and not to deny that Congress would then turn around and want to up the ante in terms of aid to Israel to make up to Netanyahu what he lost. I mean, it, 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 it just didn't work. But, but Sam, you've been involved in electoral politics here and you were part of our community uh, organizing back in the 80s. And, we used to make the argument, as we did in the Jackson campaign, that, that if you take a position on the Middle East, um, Democrats actually aren't going to lose as many Jewish votes as votes they might win in the Arab community and other communities, the progressives that would support it. We've never been able to establish that as a breakthrough moment where, even with Bernie, who did very well with the Arab American vote in different, different, uh, different states, we never were able to establish it as a, as a part of the political cal calculation. They calculate us in on state elections. I mean, w when you're running for governor in, in Michigan, you pay attention to the Arab vote. You even do it in Virginia. And clearly here in Pennsylvania, the past several Democratic governors have looked to the Arab American community and courted them and done things with them. Uh, and it happens in Ohio too. But when it comes to presidential politics, the, the smart guys, the sort of the, the smart ass white boys in Washington who do the politics say, you know, kind of look, where, where do the, where's the Jews? Where's the, 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 where are blacks? Where are Hispanics? And we don't factor in at all. And that, that's a setback for us. I mean, it doesn't enter us into the political calculation, the calculus of how you measure communities and their impact in, in, in victory. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think there's, there's several things at play. First is, the track record of the United States as it relates to the Palestinian issue doesn't give us much hope 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or today that there's going to be a major breakthrough where the U.S. does the right thing. 
in order for our community to mobilize at the level it needs to mobilize money and votes, we'll never be able to have the money impact and I don't think the voting impact, if we're not going to be part and parcel of the communities that we live in, can be made. What do I mean by that? When I was active here in the 80s, uh, we were a one-issue community. It was all about Palestine-Israel. What I saw today, and I've been here for a month and a half traveling around, is our community is much more involved in domestic issues and other international issues, and I think that's what's gonna get us traction moving forward where we no longer become a single issue community. Added to that is the situation on the ground, and I can speak for hours about it, is deteriorating at a pace where this is no longer about the Jewish community or the Jewish vote. This is about strategic US policy in the Middle East. If we are sincere to ourselves as an institution called the United States, that Israel is a strategic partner that strategic partner is about to impose a one-state solution in a place where it cannot live in a one-state solution. We can as Palestinians. So if you love Israel out of your ears, this is the time where you have to act, whether you're Arab American or Jewish American or others, in order to safeguard a paradigm that everyone has coalesced around as being the next step forward to get us out of this 40-year mess that we're in. That requires local politics, what you taught me, Jim, 30 years ago is back to the ABCs of global politics is local politics, and we have to get active in our communities. What I saw different from the last 20 years is the, the Muslim community is organized in a fashion that it never was organized before. And that component, even though there's this Islamophobia cloud around it, I think has the opportunity to add a lot of value added to where we're moving forward. And to end just on what you questioned, Deborah, on, I think your question is very accurate. It's not only what can be done in the current situation, but it's what can be done which is meaningful. Because sometimes doing nothing is better than taking another step forward and having it fail. When Hillary negotiated in 2005 the movement and access issue, which had in it things like linking the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I'm a business person, I'm not a politician. If she, if the United States was able to put teeth behind that agreement, I believe my company could have hired five people in Gaza and competed with what today is the only game in Gaza called Hamas. Israel doesn't want there to be another game in Gaza. So they don't allow the private sector to enter. They don't allow civil society to enter. They don't allow international NGOs to do their work. So the U.S., what we can do which is meaningful politically is recognize Palestine because that changes the equation. If we're talking about two states, let's just dissect it for 20 seconds. What does it mean when we say two states? It means that about 80% of our policies, both states, are going to be dictated to us by agreements that are uh, existing in the international community, which all two states agree to. When Canada and the US have frequency interference on their cell phones, they don't start a war. When Palestine and Israel are going to have frequency interference, they go back to the International Telecommunications Union and whatever rules and regulations are there, we apply. We don't have to create a negotiating file for every aspect of our life if we're serious about two states. There are some issues that have to be negotiated, like borders, but how we're gonna live together, how we're gonna move. Uh, we can't marry if the other person doesn't have the right ID card. Those are things where the U.S. can act today to maintain that the two states is the direction. But the political move is one of recognition. And if we look back at the last 20 years, significant issues, significant policy actions in the U.S. took place from November 8th to January 20th. That window, if it has recognition in it, will set a very clear tone in Israel that you can't keep building settlements because there is a Palestinian state emerging. If the U.S. cannot make that real politics and just keeps talking about two states, I guarantee you the younger generation, because I, I live amongst them, they will say, you know what, Sam? You're a pretty stupid secular Palestinian, thinking that you can, after 40 years, try to get Israel to stop settlement building. You know what? We can't make them stop. Let them build. And you know what? Let them build even faster. Because once the eggs become an omelet, you can't undo it. 
So if they want to create a one-state solution, let's start a civil rights struggle. I tell my two daughters, don't jump too quickly to that, because that is an apartheid situation. And we don't desire to move to apartheid. We desire to move out of occupation. A very simple equation. Thank you, Sam. Um, I actually wanted to ask Sam, can I ask Sam a question? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, what you did, the last thing you said was fascinating to me. I, well, here's a question I, I'm really interested in. If, sorry, Jim. No. What, what is keeping Palestinians from making that move now? To move to a civil rights struggle? To move to the, to the one state struggle that, that you, the one state civil rights struggle that you say that younger people are more inclined towards. I, I believe what's holding them back right now is the existing Palestinian leadership. It is the last cohort of the traditional Palestinian leadership which has bought in, in a serious way, and in a political way, and in a written way, into two-state solution, mm -hmm. into a two-state solution. And that's why the urgency for the U.S. to act now, mm -hmm. for Obama to act before he leaves office, is, is, is prime. Because in a year or two or less, Abbas will not be there. And what comes next, nobody actually knows, because our political system, as you know, is paralyzed. And the fear is, the political fear, is that the younger generation will just throw the entire accomplishments of the Palestinian people up until now over their shoulder and start over again. And that's, a, I believe, a dangerous move forward. Not that I don't think we can live in one state together, but not today. Hmm. Well, let's take some questions. Let me start with you back here. Yeah, ma'am, you, yeah. And uh, then I'm going to get you all the way in the back. And uh, I'm going to come back down here. We're going to move around. I'm going to get you. Yes. District of Columbia. And you know, let me just tell you, in 1988, I did. They used to joke I was the two-two state solution guy. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was doing Palestine, I was doing D.C. Yeah. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? 26 years later, nothing. <laughs> Well, Nothing. I, I, to this last conversation, because I first visited Israel and Palestine nine years ago, mm -hmm. and as an American, what struck me was this is one country. You can't even find the green line on most Israeli maps. Most Israelis don't even know when they're crossing it. The people have so much in common culturally. They're both highly educated. They're be so dynamic, and what is what we as Americans, which I find a, a repulsive, are supporting is an ethnically based, segregated state. And a two-state solution doesn't resolve the problem because you still have 20% or more of the Israeli population within the green line that's Palestinian, that's discriminated against, in addition to having a Swiss cheese in the West Bank and Gaza and all the rest, and then all the refugees who have a right to return to their home and who could see it or have, still have the keys to their houses. And what you really are talking about is fundamentally human rights of all people. And that how it gets organized politically is something to be negotiated, whether it's a federal system or you could have states within it, but it is really one country and it's a terribly unjust and horrible things are happening and for those of us who were old enough to have been involved in the civil rights issues here in the 20th century, much less know what our whole dreadful history is and all of that, we are supporting and repeating that stuff, saying that we support Israel. We're, and I really think, I'm, I'm just surprised that you mentioned your children, because I think they're right. The, w the way this is going to be resolved and so many issues become simple that are really complex now, if you look at you're going to have a single secular state and you need something like the First Amendment with freedom of religion, freedom of your speech, freedom of organization, and participation in your government. I'm and if you do that, then you will have the opportunity, however you organize within that state, to have a really dynamic place. If you don't, you just perpetuate the same problems, and you get the same thing that's happened to us in the District of Columbia. You get a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but we're denied liberty and we're denied our fundamental right to okay. self-government. Thank you. I, I want to ask Sam and, and Peter to come to the back. 
Um, my response would be this. Um, it's true that it is uh, um, that these two peoples are living cheek, cheek by jowl together. It's certainly true that Israeli maps uh, uh, don't, and I think Palestinian maps too, don't generally show the green line. Um, that's, that's all true. But this is, but this, this is also true. Um, these are two separate peoples, both of whom desire national self-determination. And their national identities, their desire for not simply individual rights, but for national rights, for national self-determination representation, has not waned, has not grown weaker. Binational states are very difficult to make work. They barely, rarely works in Belgium. Right? We're not sure if the United Kingdom will be able to hold itself together. The Czechs and the Slovaks could not hold itself together. We are not, if you look at the Middle East more generally, and even not just the Middle East, look at Europe, we are not living in, a, in an age, maybe sadly, in which states that don't have a strong underlying common national identity are doing very well. And my question uh, about the idea of one state is what is the national identity that undergirds it? I think there are lots of differences between Israel and South Africa, but one of the differences, there was an identity called South African that, that both whites and blacks, for all of their differences, shared in a way that Jewish, Israelis, and Palestinians do not share. Um, and now that's not to say it could not change. It's not to say that we could not in some future, that these, you know, culture can change, right? I'm making a conservative argument, right? Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously said that well, liberals believe that politics matters uh, more than culture. Um, and conservatives believe, uh, liberals believe that politics can change culture, conservatives believe that culture matters more than politics. I think I'm somewhere in between. Culture matters. So if you're going to talk to me about the one state solution, the question I'm going to ask is, what's, what's the national identity there? If you have an, what's the army going to look like? If you tell, this, you're going to have a situation in what's the joint Jewish-Palestinian brigade of the Israstein army? How is it going to hold together when it has to go and either evict Jews from their homes they've lived in since 1951 or tell Palestinians they can't return to those homes? My fear is that what you will get is something like what we had in Iraq, which is basically a common flag, a common supposed military, and basically militias in civil war. One day, Yes, one day maybe you could have that transformational identity. But when people talk about a secular binational state, I'm not sure where I see the huge demand for secular binationalism on either side. And Jim did a poll, I mean, Jim did a poll a few years ago on this question. And what it showed was there's much more support for two state solution, among, to, than, for two states than one state, at least today, maybe that'll change, among virtually every different population group in this uh, in this conflict, the Jim, Jim they, 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 they interviewed Palestinian citizens of Israel, they interviewed refugees, they interviewed Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, and of course Israeli Jews. Right now, there's not the demand for that. There's a demand for national self-determination. The last thing I will say is, you are right that a two-state solution would not solve the problem. You are right that Israel will still have to reckon with the 20% of, of its population that is Palestinian, and that poses a profound challenge, and I think will force Israel to redefine in some very important and fundamental ways what it means by Jewish state. Let's remember, Israel has never defined what it means by, ha by Jewish state. It doesn't have a constitution in large major because it can't do that. So yes, it will not resolve the conflict, but I think it will be a step forward in resolving the conflict. Sam? A couple of thoughts very quickly. First, I would recommend to go back and read Resolution 181, which is the first mention of a division of the country. Nobody has to remind the Palestinians that it was one country, believe me. Uh, if you open up most Palestinian chests, you'll find a chain that has a map of Palestine. It's historic Palestine. It's not the West Bank and Gaza strung together by a rubber band. So we understand very well that it was one state. Our struggle began by calling for it to remain one state. We have since politically matured because the reality on the ground has forced us to, and I ask that we don't become more Christian than the Pope, because the Palestinian leadership, through a lot of tears and tear and blood and sweat, have reached a political realization that they have accepted the internationally accepted two-state solution. I didn't accept it. The Palestinian leadership accepted it. It's political capital that has already been spent. Now, if you ask me how I dream, yes, I dream of one country living side by side, both peoples without a problem. That's not the reality today on the ground. The reality today on the ground is that you have an encroaching occupation 
which is now starting to talk about annexation of the West Bank, forced feeding, not the one state like you and I have in mind, like Pennsylvania and Ohio, but one state like South Africa was under apartheid. I don't desire to live in a state of apartheid. So in my politics today, I call for two states because every single other country in the world, including the US and the Palestinian leadership, and supposedly formerly the Israeli leadership, call for the same. So if politics is what can be done today, that's what can be done today. I think my children and their children and the generations of Israelis to follow will be smarter on how they live together. Remember, when we talk about two states, we don't talk about two states with a 10 meter wall in between. We talk about two states before Netanyahu and Sharon took office. We talk about two states where I can get in the car and go to the sea, and an Israeli citizen can go to Jericho for a visit. That's the two states that we're talking about. It's how Jerusalem is an open city, that the two states should be an open two-state system. We wrote, I wrote with an Israeli friend of mine, Bernard Abishai, a couple years back in Haaretz, an article called Independent and Interdependent. There is no country which is independent today in the, in the rigid term of independent. Independence is part and parcel of a global system of governance. We will have to be interdependent. Our water doesn't know two states. Our nature doesn't know two states. Our frequencies don't know two states. So yes, there will be some kind of federated agreement between the two sides. But for national identity to be defined, statehood is how we define it today. Now, if the world wants to throw states out of the window, I may be in that camp, but mm -hmm. that's not where we are today. And I, you know, I, thi <clears throat> I think that some uh, 100 years from now, um, I see a Middle East where uh, an, Arab, an Arab boy in Amman marries a Jewish girl from Tel Aviv, and they go settle in the suburbs of Damascus. <laughs> um, that sort of regional integration is what is inevitable I think historically it's either that or else we self-destruct. Um, but we're not there. We're clearly not there. I mean, it, unfortunately, we're not there to the point where an Arab boy from Jerusalem can't marry an Arab girl from Bethlehem and move to Nazareth. I mean, I always argue that if the Jesus, Mary, and Joseph story took place today, it couldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. <laughs> And then if, when Herod was coming after all the little bo newborns, the, they couldn't have gone from Bethlehem to Egypt, right? I mean, it, we'd have an entirely different world if we had the restrictions we got today. You back there with the mic, what? Oh, who was under, you, you were raising your hand for him? <laughs> okay. You were cheating, man. All right. Yes, hi, uh, my name's Atif Farish. I'm a uh, Palestinian from California here for the convention. Uh, just wanted to thank all of you for a very thought-provoking discussion. I, I thought it was great, um, all of you were great. And then humbled by the decades-long work between all four of you for justice in the Middle East, justice in Palestine. Um, the question was, where do we go from here um, as a policy for the next president, as a policy for the next political party at the next convention, let's say in 2020? Um, maybe going to that question is the one state solution. We've been focused on an unfeasible solution in the Middle East. The, the fact is uh, what's going on on the ground, the settlements are something that the Israeli leadership don't have the political capital to dismantle. So what if we change our direction here and start focusing on a one state solution as opposed to an unfeasible two state solution. And I know you guys just addressed this, but I, I think that for me as a Palestinian American or somebody that's con uh, concerned with uh, justice in Palestine, I think that's the only approach that we can take. Deborah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to take that because he, he raises an issue that is sort of, uh, one of the issues that's behind your issue is the Israeli leadership and Sam raised it as well. There are things that America can do, but with an Israeli leadership like Netanyahu uh, and a Palestinian leadership that is dysfunctional or non-functional, that also puts constraints on what American policy can, can do. So can I just ask her to do that? You wanna finish, but I wanna ask her to do that. Yes, I just have one more point to make, is that all of the political capital that's, that Sam mentioned, that the entire world has put into a two-state solution, mm -hmm. you can easily achieve that overnight by having a, um, a rights-based movement, 
um, a okay. civil liberties movement in, okay. in Palestine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you deal with both, but, but, but in particular, I'd like to have you deal with the fact of what, when we're looking for options of what American leadership can do, um, we have to add to that the additional constraint that it, what they can do given what is possible, what can be built given what's there. Well, Sam's point about U.S. recognizing the fact that Palestinian, Palestine is a state, that's something you can do with, with, uh, you know, with a ham sandwich in charge, right? I mean, it, it doesn't require a leadership that can actually do something. But, but Netanyahu is a different story. He's there. You've got to deal with the fact that he's there. So what can be done? Uh, he is there, and not only is he there, but we're about to reach in, I think, about a year and a half, he will have served longer than um, any other Israeli prime minister who's going to surpass Ben-Gurion. That is not a record that we should be pleased with. We're also, by the way, approaching an anniversary that we should not be pleased with. We're coming up on 50 years of the occupation. So I think we need to look at the leadership in, um, in all three of the countries. Um, uh, and I do think uh, that the, there are things that the U.S. can do, that the administration can do. I think one of the um, uh, failures uh, or one of, one of the places where the Obama administration loses points is that they really failed to do anything to help build up um, Salam Fayyad. Uh, he was um, doing, you know, really important work in, you know, uh, strengthening the NGO community, building an infrastructure, uh, building a state, in essence. And I think that there are things that the U.S. can do uh, in both places as relates to the leadership. Uh, there are economic incentives. They're the kinds of things that Sam was talking about um, in the economic arena to empower those that are doing the things, uh, not necessarily that we may like or dislike, but in keeping with U.S. policy, which is in support of two states, which is against settlements. Um, that is long time U.S. policy. And I think that when there are violations um, on either side of those policies, uh, and you mentioned settlements, uh, Peace Now in Israel is the organization that, that does, uh, is significantly known for the monitoring um, and the recording of uh, the growth of settlements. It's uh, it, it's their aerial photographs and so forth that all of the governments, including ours, uh, use um, to see where Israel is uh, expanding settlements and when the reports they're giving are, are, uh, are not accurate. So focusing on settlements, when those are violated, there needs to be uh, an understanding uh, that there will be consequences, that those actions can't be taken, and that there will be actions, uh, consequences for them. I, your question is, is, is well stated, uh, Jim, in that, you know, there is a leadership there. It, you know, we, the, the U.S. can only work with the leadership that's there, but in addition to the kinds of things that everybody stated can be done, there are measures that the U.S. can do. There are actions and consequences that the U.S. can take. They don't even need to be public. Um, in order to get uh, leaders on both sides to either build up and help sustain and empower the Palestinian leadership or to get uh, the Israeli-Palestinian to, uh, the Israeli leadership um, to take different actions. I think it's a challenge, but I, I do not, I believe that there is a will uh, and a tenacity there to do it that, that it can be done. We're running out of time. I, I promised you, uh, where, where? Yes, you, you. And then I want to give everybody a chance to respond. Sam. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to bring a different voice and a question about an, one more voice to the, to the table, and that is the unique role that American Christians can play. Um, all of you at, are vital to this. I've presented a couple times. I met Sam in Bethlehem this summer on a, on a trip there where we saw the real, I believe, the real side of things and uh, have since presented to Christian groups. They're surprised. I had no idea what was going on is the most common refrain, but the biggest thing uh, is that Palestinians are Christians. Most of my Christian friends don't, Palestinians are Muslims, and Muslims are the other. And that being wrong doesn't make it not true that Christians don't recognize that when they talk about how Christians are persecuted around the world, Christians are persecuted in the Middle East, 
that they don't recognize that Christians are persecuted in Israel by the occupation government, that that's not talked about. Is there any suggestion you have for those of us in the audience who are American Christians to communicate to our own communities and to be a voice? Because we're not even considered a lobby. We are kind of considered the mainstream. There so are, anything you can offer. There Thank are resources uh, specifically on that. And if you write to me uh, at the office, uh, I'd be very happy to share with you material. I serve on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I have to tell you that, that when we talk about silence and the, the, the deadly silence, uh, the commission will not touch uh, the treatment of Christians in, in fact, the first year I joined the commission, three and a half years ago, uh, they were doing a Christmas op-ed on Christians being persecuted in the Middle East. And this op-ed began in the, in, it, is the it, it is tragic that in the place where Jesus was born, Christians, and I started, oh, I said, oh this is going to be good. I looked at the draft. And uh, there was no mention of Bethlehem, no mention of Palestine. And I said, why? This, because we don't talk about that. And that we don't mean that. We mean Syria and Iraq and Egypt and whatever. And so I brought in material, and I was like shunned for a month because I dared raise the question of treatment of Christians. We brought the patriarch of Jerusalem to meet with the commissioners. They harassed him for about a half hour on Hamas, as if he had any role to play in that. It, it, is, um, it is shocking, the silence on the treatment of Christians and the treatment of people generally. And the, the rights movement issue that you raise is fundamental, I believe. It is, at the end of the day, what it was when we started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign. It is a human rights movement, like any human rights movement in the world. We ignore it, and we've, we've made that subordinate to the political issue. They both have to be elevated. They both have to be elevated. We can walk and chew gum at the same time on that one. But I thank you for that question. And like I said, write me and I will get you resources. Let me get a few words from each person on the panel and we will close it out. Pardon? What commission? U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I'd like to just uh, cover a couple of the qu last questions that were done. First, regarding the Christian community. Thank you for coming and visiting because I think that's one big step that when, once you see this, you can't deprogram yourself. So coming is an important issue. Also, the Cairo statement and movement within the church community is a key mobilizing uh, tool that one can use in the Christian community. And I sit on the board of another organization called EAPPI, the Ecumenical uh, Organization of Accompaniers. So uh, if your church can volunteer people to come and spend a month or two or three to help children walk to school so the settlers see some external factor, which helps, uh, that also is an eye opener. The second one I wanted to mention is the question in the back regarding uh, what, what can be done on the ground. I'm an old time political person. I go back to the basics. If I read yesterday's convention floor properly, Bernie's not going home to go to sleep. And I think the, the young people and his organization, as they move out of this convention and electoral season, <clears throat> similar to how Jesse Jackson left 1984 and the Rainbow Coalition took over for a while, uh, that needs to be tapped into in a very serious way, and not only about Palestine and Israel, but everything from Palestine and Israel all the way to police relations in America. So getting involved on that local level is important. When Bernie humanized Palestinians with a couple words, what did he get in return from Hillary? A rattling off of AIPAC's talking points. There are things that need to be done post-election that are serious around this issue. The last point is back to this issue of one state. I forgot to mention, I just recently finished a policy paper around this specific issue of one state, two state. If you go to epalestine.com, you'll be able to pick it up there. But the case that I make, and I actually make it with a researcher in the UK who ha uh, is a colleague of mine, is that for too long, the rights issue has been packaged and placed behind the issue of a negotiated solution. So we propose to di dissect those. The negotiations must continue until it resolves the conflict. There's no way that Israel's going to win militarily or we're going to lose militarily. It will have to be negotiated. In the meantime, human rights, as Jim just noted, is key to this issue, and we can no longer pretend like all the human rights issue will be resolved once a negotiated solution is reached. We actually propose that since we're coming up on 50 years of military occupation, let's use that anniversary 
and turn to the one country in the world, except for the Republican and Democratic Party now, the one country in the world that refuses to recognize it as an occupation, the occupier. Let's turn to them on the 50th anniversary and say, Israel, okay, you decide. If it's an occupation, then it needs to end and soon because 50 years is a long time. If it's not an occupation, then we are subjects under your jurisdiction and should be provided all of our rights while we negotiate for a two-state solution. <laughs> while we negotiate for a two-state solution, which may take another 100 years. Can any of us really think that the Palestinians are gonna remain in this rather peaceful mode of existence for another 100 years of occupation? The rights have to be addressed. And I, I urge you to read the policy paper because that, that's the argument that's made. Peter? Um, uh, um, I, I think to start with your, your point about Christians, I, I think um, the truth is that um, uh, American Jews, the, certainly the American, mainstream American Jewish community, is very, very afraid and hostile uh, to the idea of Christians becoming involved in this conversation, unless they're right-wing evangelical Christians. Um, and, um, and, and, the tr and this is partly, obviously, a political calculation, but it, 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 it's something deeper. I mean, the, the, the truth is that even among many very progressive uh, American Jews, uh, even if they hear a, a, an American Christian say verbatim the same thing that they have said, it makes them uncomfortable. Um, there is, um, uh, even if it's entirely irrational, there is um, a deep anxiety and fear about motivations. Um, and I think that actually limits the effectiveness of the progressive side. Because on the American Jewish right, Zionist Organization for America, they have no problem right, bringing in whichever right-wing you know, right evangelical or you know, Fox News host Looney Tune. Um, to, but, but on the left, I think you see this tendency of saying, well, kind of, let's do, we're going to do it ourselves. Don't worry. You please just stay. And, 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 and I think that, that, that weakens us. Um, and I think it, it's based on a series of, of anxieties that have to be confronted in ourselves um, and that have to be confronted by building relationships so that when you actually know people, you can have a degree of comfort that they're actually speaking from, first of all, that they have absolutely every right as Christians to care about that part of the world and we are not the only monotheistic religion, right? Uh, first, the, we're not the only people who have equities there. Um, and secondly, they have a right, they have a right to follow their moral compass. Um, um, but we need to try to develop relationships so we can deal, overcome our own anxieties. And if we find people who are genuinely, we do feel like are trafficking some degree of anti-Semitism or an anti-Semitic discourse that they may not even fully be aware of, then we can challenge that. But I think that, um, uh, that's a weakness on the American Jewish left, I think, some elements of the American Jewish left right now. Um, the other um, uh, challenge I, would, I, just, I think is um, that um, we, uh, we, have not, that we, have not we have not built in the American Jewish community a conversation about Jewish power. The subject of Jewish power is still largely a taboo topic among American Jews. The dominant discourse is basically a discourse of victimhood and survival. And essentially, if you, are, if you believe the world has not really changed since 1938, the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto didn't have any moral obligations to anyone except for themselves to survive. And that is basically the discourse that's perpetuated by APAC and Benjamin Netanyahu. I think where I think there is great opportunity is that that discourse generally, except to some degree in, in the Orthodox community, falls on deaf ears among young American Jews because it simply bears no real relationship with the lives in which they're living as privileged, mostly white American Jews whose families have been here for 100 years, who've seen Israel as a regional superpower with nuclear weapons. The discourse that's actually much more powerful in my experience to them is the discourse, is, is a, is a dis narrative that says, your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents sacrificed enormously to change Jewish history so that Jews were not history's permanent victims, to transform the condition of American Jews and, and Jews around the world. And then the question is, what do you do with that accomplishment, right? The Jewish history is not static. The question is, once Jews have achieved power and privilege, what are the ethical obligations of that power? How do you use it? You know, Jews like to, we, we, it's so deep that we don't even, even when we tell the story of our own Jewish holidays, 
right? American Jews tell the story of Purim as if the book of Esther ends when Jews are saved from Haman, from Haman, right? We never talk about the end of the book of Esther, right, in which Jews actually retaliate and carry out a massacre of 75,000 people because the idea of Jewish power and the ethical responsibilities of it, even though it's, it's all, it's there in Jewish text, is erased from the American Jewish narrative, right? We tell the story of Hanukkah, we end with the, the rededication of the temple and the restore, restoration of Jewish sovereignty. We never talk about the moral corruption that took place once the Maccabees took power, right? Even though the rabbis were highly attuned to that because we have not adapted our discourse to this moment in American Jewish history. But I think when we start to do that, it actually ha it really unlocks something among young American Jews to be say, this is actually the moment that we're in now and this is how we can actually kind of keep faith with the experience of our parents and grandparents. And especially when you talk to young American Jews about the fact that Jews went to Mississippi uh, in the, during the Civil Rights Movement um, uh, as a way of, of, of honoring our own experience. And to say to them, the equivalent of that today might well be going to Bethlehem or to Hebron, as I was lucky enough to do 10 days ago with a group of 50 diaspora Jews. And to say, you know, the, the way that we show that it's meaningful that the Torah says 36 times that we remember that we must treat a stranger with dignity because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. The way to actually make that meaningful today is to actually go and stand with Palestinians who lack basic rights. So that would be my hope, the transformation we'll see. So I, I'm usually the one at organizational meetings that they bring in to do the hope thing at the <laughs> end of the meeting so that people leave feeling good and feeling hopeful. Um, I may digress from that uh, today. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is to finish up by sharing um, something from the writings of Amos Oz, uh, who's one of the most revered authors in Israel and one is one of the, was one of the founders of Peace Now in Israel, um, who writes about the Israeli, uh, this was one of the first things I read after I took this job many years ago, uh, and um, he talks about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a tragedy, and he says it is a true tragedy because not in the Western sense of a tragedy where there are good guys and bad guys and some are wearing white hats and some are wearing black hats. He says it's a tragedy in the true sense of the word because there are two righteous claims to the same piece of land. And he said there are two kinds of tragedy, Chekhovian tragedies and Shakespearean tragedies. At the end of a Shakespearean tragedy, all the players are on the stage dead. At the end of a Chekhovian tragedy, all of the players are depressed, they're disillusioned, they're unhappy, they're miserable, and he says what we need to hope for for the resolution of this conflict is that it is a Chekhovian tragedy. I, just starting this job, said, oi. <laughs> so I, what he also said, though, is he talked about Israelis and Palestinians as having, be, like being a couple living in a very large house, and they're going to get divorced, and they have to divide up this house. They can't afford to sell it and buy a new one. So they figure there's a couple rooms that they can share going in at different times, maybe a bathroom, maybe a kitchen, and they get the rest of the house. And that's what we ought to be looking at, and that's how he talks about two states, and that's how we talk about two states. I would urge all of you, if you do nothing else, I would urge all of you to arm yourself with knowledge and arm others with knowledge and go out and talk about the realities. Make sure you're up to date. We've talked a lot about organizations, our own and others. Matt Duss is here, Foundation for Middle East Peace, one of the sponsors. Um, it, go to websites, get materials from the organizations that you feel an affinity to or with who you agree with and arm yourself and arm other people and talk about what's going on there and how, why it's important to get active and engaged and change it. So that when we come back in 2020, we actually are having a very different discussion. Um, and I, 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 I want to thank all three of you for um, um, a striking uh, discussion. It was, it was actually uh, quite beneficial to me and I, I and I hope to also to you and I also encourage you to take a look on our website at our new poll 
Um, and I just want to point out one thing in the poll that sort of leaves you with a challenge. You will find that the numbers are, as I said they are, uh, extraordinarily positive uh, in terms of the margins of those who are moving in the right direction and those who don't get it. Um, but what's also true is the, 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 the really large number of people who are not sure. In the 90s, when we did this polling um, during the peace process, that didn't exist. People were focused on the issue. But if you say now a question like this issue, is, is it an occupation or not? I mean, should we use the term occupation or not? You get about 50% who say, I don't know. And, um, and, and that's true on a number of the questions. So that is both depressing, I think. You know, we're, we're living in a little bubble where we all think about this stuff. Most people aren't think, haven't thought about it now in 15, 20 years. Um, and it also presents an opportunity because opinions aren't hardened. There, there may be 40 in favor and, and 14 opposed, which is a good number, but that almost half that don't have an opinion right now are there to be molded. And if we don't do them, somebody else is. So take a look at the numbers and, and, and work with them and work with all of us, depending upon your perspective, and others, like Deborah just said, who are out there, so that hopefully we can build uh, a movement uh, to actually change the political dynamic, to move this and the next administration forward so that we have a different discussion four years from now and don't have to wait another 20 till this issue comes back to our politics. Thank you all very much. I really enjoyed it.